voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare. Or perhaps the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And so the gospel writer Mark begins his telling of the the coming of the good news of Jesus. And now we gather here as those who are preparing uh, to follow the way of the Lord, uh, and indeed that very way of the Lord uh, that gathers us. And so good morning, church. Welcome uh, to worship on this second of Advent. Um, My name is Kevin White. I'm the pastor here uh, this morning. Brad uh, Cruzan is uh, our pulpit assistant and will be assisting in in worship. Um, And if you are uh, are new or or new-ish here here in the sanctuary or uh, joining online, uh, we would love to know how to be in touch and stay in touch. So um, there are welcome cards in the pews here. And if you're online, we'd love to, you know, shoot us an email um, or or leave us a, a send us a message right here on uh, Facebook, um, and uh, we'll know how to get in touch with you. And that way, we can make sure that we are uh, in in touch uh, together. Um, a couple things. One, uh, we had a, a wonderful uh, concert here last night. The SOS band, um, big band, Rhode Island's uh, SOS big band, did their swinging into the season holiday concert. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, we uh, collected I don't know how many boxes of food, f- four, five or six, I think, boxes of of canned goods and, and food and. Uh, uh, collected uh, almost $500 for the food pantry down the way. So uh, it, was a, it was a great time. Thank you to our um, community care committee, you know, uh, Betty and Lynn and uh, Nancy um, and Lily uh, really did a lot and uh, hosting and stuff. So that was, that was wonderful. Um, that is good. Very, very good. And you may have noticed when you came in, um, it may not have looked all that different. Uh, the siding that looked you may have thought, oh, when is the siding project getting started? It has started, and the siding that is up is the new, is new siding. So uh, that is well underway. They hopefully, um, uh, God, God willing and weather cooperating, um, looks like probably this week it will be completed. So uh, that is also wonderful, wonderful news. And well, we are indeed here that the way of Jesus might be prepared in us. Uh, And so I invite us as we begin our time together uh, to join in prayer. Let us pray. Great God, in these times between your birth and your coming again, we hear these words of John the Baptist for us today. In baptizing and receiving confessions, John pointed beyond himself to Christ. Help us to embody the good news that John proclaimed, to embody it in our words and in our work, that our lives may also tell of the coming of Christ. Teach us to share good news with those who yearn for transformation and to to listen for your gospel when we need a change of heart. And Lord, even here and even now in this place, may it be so. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. In this season of preparation and the season of song, please join in our song call to worship, the second verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. The words can be found in your bulletin.
This morning, we invite the Cliff Siders Bible Study Group to come and light the Advent candle. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Steadfast love will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. Please join in the responsive prayer in the bulletin. So praise me, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I invite you now to take a moment uh, and greet one another uh, with the peace of Christ, uh, the same peace that we proclaim this season. sit down. We're going to go on a little field trip. I want us to go look at some stuff while we're up here, okay? Can you come with me? Let's see what we find. Let's walk over here. Do you see anything that's not here most of the time that might be out this time of year? It's a lot of candles. Do you see anything over here? Do you know what this is? It's a manger scene. That's right. We've got, what do we have here? What do we have up here? Do you know what? An angel? We have an angel. We've got some sheep. Maybe, if that's the sheep, is that maybe a shepherd? And some other animals here in the manger. And we have Joseph and Mary, Jesus' parents. And what do you think belongs there? Jesus. Jesus. It, it's empty. Maybe that's because we're in a time of year. We have this set up and we're preparing for Jesus. Do you think Jesus is going to show up here sometime? I think so, too. Maybe we'll have to keep watch for when Jesus shows up. Yeah, we'll keep a lookout for Jesus uh, with us. Hmm. Do you know, can you think of anything that's not, else that's not here? That's sometimes in a manger scene? We've got the, let's see, maybe some of these, some of the grown-ups can help us out. We've got the angel, we've got Mary and Joseph, we've got some of the animals, the shepherds. Anybody else that's... 
the wise men. Do you know the mangers have wise men? You know that? I wonder, wonder why they're not here. Hmm. I wonder if they're somewhere. Shall we see if we can find them? I think they might be somewhere in this room. Let's go see if we can find them. Let's walk this way and see. <gasps> hmm. Do you see maybe some wise men somewhere? I mean, this room is full of wise men and women, for sure. <laughs> but we're looking for three in particular. Let's see. Oh, what do you think? Over here? Why do you think they're all the way over here? Because they traveled. They went, came a long way. They heard about Jesus, and they wanted to come a long way. So they're still traveling. Sometimes, sometimes God invites us to walk a path, to follow where God leads us. And then we can see Jesus more clearly. And that's what the wise men did. So I think in these next couple weeks, they're going to maybe start to get closer and closer. Will you help me in the next couple weeks keep an eye on how, how their travels are going? All right, let's walk back up. All right, we're going to see if we can keep track of them and their journey. All of these remind us of the wonderful ways that Jesus has come to us. Uh, and that we are, uh, God asks us to make room in our hearts for Jesus. And sometimes God invites us to go on journeys following where God leads so that we can see Jesus more clearly. Even, even no matter how old or young we are, God invites all of us to do those things. So this, this season, do you think you and maybe you can help your mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and your friends also make room for Jesus in our lives? And maybe follow, follow where God leads. Think we can do that? Yeah, you think we can do that? All right, sure. Yes, good. <laughs> good. Let's, let's pray. God, we thank you for these wonderful signs and reminders uh, that you have come to us uh, and that you invite all of us to make room in our hearts and to follow where you lead. And all God's children said, amen. All right. Cameron, thank you for coming up. You were very, very brave to come up this, this morning. Thank you. In the opening hymn. Uh, we, we skip the, you know what, we should, we should confess. <laughs> All right, so that's why Cameron was a little, we weren't leaving. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we got a hymn too. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Tell you what, let's sing, and then we'll confess, and then we'll go on from there. Let's stand and sing hymn number 15, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers.
Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that the Lord is, slow, is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting anything to perish, but all come to repentance. Let us therefore use this time to confess and repent. Please join me in our corporate prayer of confession, followed by a moment of personal confession. Let us pray. God, you are the Lord over all of history gone by and all of history yet to come. Have mercy on us, for we are not ready for your coming. We live in sin as though there were no justice. We live in fear as though there were no grace. Forgive us, Lord. Show us your mercy and steadfast love. Lead us in your truth and teach us your paths. For you are the God of our salvation. Now a moment for personal confession. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Now hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Beloved, believe what has been spoken, that good news that in Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father. Old Testament reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. If you'd like to follow along, it can be found beginning on page 667 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bible. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Holy God, our hope and strength, by the power of your Spirit, prepare the way in our hearts for the coming of your word, so that we may see the glorious signs of your promise fulfilled. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The words of the prophet Isaiah, let us listen for the word of God. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I say, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their consistency is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass wither and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So in the Appalachian region, there is a, a tradition of quilt making, um, and they make these beautiful quilts, if you've ever seen them. They are just gorgeous. Uh, and one of the traditions is uh, that in all this intricate stitching and everything, they would, they would intentionally do some wrong stitches, get some stuff out of order, and it was a reminder uh, that nobody is perfect. Um, and so when I stitched together this morning's order of service, that's what I did. It was a theological statement and reminder to us, or at least that's the story I'm going with. In just a moment, we're going to uh, read from Matthew chapter 1, uh, beginning with, with verse 1, uh, and if you want to follow along when we get there, uh, you can find it uh, on page 1 of the, the New Testament. Um, but before we read, uh, just a, a little bit of where we are. Um, this morning, we continue our Advent series. Uh, we are looking, um, in these weeks of Advent, we are looking at how each of the four gospel writers uh, begins their account of Jesus, how they, uh, in their writing, prepare us to see Jesus, how they prepare us for the coming of Jesus. Each of the four gospel writers, um, right, we have, we have four gospel accounts, not one, we have four God could have certainly inspired one account with everything in it that Matthew has and everything that Mark has and everything that Luke has and everything that, that John has, and it could have just been called the gospel of Jesus. But that's not what God did. We've got four. And we've recognized over the, the centuries that that is a good thing. You'll notice, uh, if you've got your Bible open to the, to the titles that were, that were uh, given uh, later on after they were written, um, at some point we gave titles, the church gave titles to these four gospel accounts, and, and the titles are the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to John. That through the inspiration of the Spirit, um, uh, the church recognized four gospel accounts, and each one with its own perspective. And that means that there is something, not just about what each of these writers tells us about Jesus, but also about how they go about it, how they tell this unfolding, multifaceted story of Jesus, how they have crafted and organized and told the story as they saw it and experienced it. And that even that helps us to see and know Jesus. Because the good news of Jesus is not just a distilled list of facts to be extracted out of the uh, embodied or experienced lived story in which they come about right so last week we looked at mark and we saw that mark doesn't so much prepare us for jesus coming as he just throws us right in right in there right into the thick of things with jesus already here and things are already happening and so Mark doesn't have anything about the birth of Jesus. He jumps right in with a, a grown-up Jesus. And grown-up John the Baptist, they just, they just seem to show up out of nowhere. And then we're off and running with a breathless flurry of action. Now this week, we're looking at Matthew's opening. Matthew's beginning. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram, well, he was the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab was the father of Nashon, and Nashon was the father of Salmon, and Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, he was the father of Joram. And Joram was the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. 
Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amos, and Amos was the father of Josiah, and Josiah, well, he was the father of Jeconia and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconia was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud, and Abiud was the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You're glad I didn't have you read that. <laughs> yeah. So that is a very different sort of beginning than we had in Mark, isn't it? <laughs> right? After this, Matthew does give us, uh, well, Matthew gives us uh, seven or eight verses um, on, uh, about baby Jesus. It's mostly actually uh, Joseph finding out that Mary's going to have a baby. Uh, and then there's just half a verse saying, yep. Mary gave birth, and they named the baby Jesus. But even that short little summary is not where Matthew starts, is it? No, he starts with 17 verses of a list of name after name after name. Now, I don't know about you, but if I am setting out to write the, the greatest story ever told, right? If I'm setting out to write the story that I believe everything else on life hinges on, that has changed everything, everything. If I'm writing that story that I want to capture the imagination and faith and lives of all who read it and hear it, if I am writing the story of the single greatest event in history, well, obviously, the best way is to give a list of names that we can barely pronounce, let alone have any clue of who most of these people were, right? That's how you start a story. There was, um, when, when Rachel and I started dating, maybe it was when we got engaged. I don't, I don't remember. Rachel can correct me on that. Um, my mom had, had re gotten into like our genealogy and had this computer program and had mapped it all out. And there was a time, where, I think it was around Christmas time, you came over to, and my whole extended family was at my, my parents' house um, and uh, for this big Christmas thing, and Rachel was meeting all these people the first time, and my mom showed up with a printout of the gene, telling her how everybody was connected, and went around the house to every room, introducing Rachel with this printout of, this, of all these people that Rachel had no idea who they were, right? But somehow it was my mom, it was important. Right? Um, this genealogy, right? Mark, um, Mark throws us into the action, but Matthew seems content to not make it very exciting, but to give us a lot of this background stuff that we're probably like, what? Right? In fact, this opening 17-verse passage is one of the passages in the Bible, in the New Testament, that, that never shows up in the, the three-year cycle of weekly lectionary readings. We jump right to, to Jesus. Right? We actually we jump ahead uh, in Matthew to where he finally gets to saying, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. Right? It's, like, uh, it's like how Netflix gives you that option to skip the opening credits. Right? Yep, click, don't mind if I do, let's get on with this. So what is Matthew doing by starting with a genealogy, with this list of names? Well, he's actually doing quite a bit. And we could, we could spend a lot of time on a lot of different things. We could spend time on, on how, in this list, we've got Jews and Gentiles in this genealogy. We've got men and women. We've got sinners and saints. We've got people of power and authority who used that power and authority well and those who used it and who abused it and failed miserably and tragically with it. And we have those who were, who were abused by those who had the power and authority. All of this is there the very wonder and tragedy of our so very human condition is here 
in this opening, it is held in the story of Jesus. Or we could spend, uh, spend time and explore the fact that, that Matthew here has been very keen and very intentional to cultivate this into groups of three, three groups of 14. If you do the math, that's six sets of seven. And so then Jesus begins the seventh, the seventh seven, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Or we could spend time with even just his opening sentence, an account of the genealogy, literally the the generations of Jesus the Messiah. And we could look at how that is a direct echo of how the first creation account in Genesis, how it ends. You have the seven days of creation, and then it says, these are, uh, this is the account, these are literally, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And so even here in the coming of Jesus, there's echoes of creation. That Jesus is intimately connected in all that has come before. When Rachel, Ezra, and I were, uh, had the opportunity to uh, spend some time in Denmark this past summer, uh, we went to the small town. Uh, I've mentioned this, I think, before. We went to the small town where my great-great-grandparents immigrated from. Anna and Jens Christensen. Tiny town. I'm not going to try to pronounce the name. Tiny town. Uh, And we went to the the church of the town. Their church. We walked around the cemetery at at the church and saw the name Christensen. And we went into the church. This little tiny church. And yet it struck me. This is a part of where I came from. And I sat in a pew That in all likelihood, who knows how many generations of my ancestors sat and worshipped. And I found myself thinking, wow, this right here is a part of why and how I am here. Right? Both that I exist, but also my faith and that I'm even a pastor. Things that happened here, the faithfulness that happened here, is a part of how I got to be here. So for today, what I want us to spend just a little time on is is thinking about how, whereas Mark gave us the the coming of Jesus as this explosion of of heaven just suddenly breaking in from the outside. Mark, remember Mark says, tore open the heavens. Heaven breaks in from the outside. Matthew gives us this slow, even very natural movement through the ages. And even God working in and through the choices and the agency of particular people. In Mark, Jesus shows up bursting from outside of human history. But in Matthew, Jesus shows up because of the outworking of human history and God in it. Jesus, fully God and fully human. God breaking into human history, and now we also see at the same time steadfastly, faithfully working in and through the generations, in and through it all along. And in that strange mix of providence and human agency. And so to explore this just a little bit, to tease it out a bit, we're going to look at a couple names in particular. Verses 5 and 6 of Matthew's genealogy. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. And so join me now as we go back even further. We go back a ways to the Old Testament book of Judges. Israel has been delivered from bondage in Egypt. They wandered those 40 years in the wilderness, and they came to the threshold of the promised land, the books Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then they have entered the promised land, the book of Joshua. And now they are struggling to live faithfully as God's people, the book of Judges. Before it was a kingdom, Israel was this confederation of of 12 tribes with God as the king. 
And long story short, Judges tells the story of their struggle to live into this, their struggle and their inability to keep the law, the way of the Lord, the covenant of God, struggling mightily to keep faithfulness. And whenever they, this would happen and they would uh, fall into faithlessness, there would be consequences. And then God would raise up a judge and call the people back. Right? Think of people like Deborah or Gideon or Samson. And there's a whole host of other judges that show up. So, for example, uh, this guy Othniel was a judge raised up in Judges chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. These five verses give a very concise description of this repeating pattern in, in Judges. It says, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, forgetting the Lord their God and worshiping the Baals and the Asherahs. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of King Cushan Rishathaim, of whom, of, of Aram Naharaim. And the Israelites served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the Israelites who delivered them, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave King Cushan Rishathaim of Aram into his hand. And his, Othniel's hand, prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim, so the land had rest forty years. Then Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. The Old Testament book of Judges is a series of stories like this, these cycles of disobedience and faithlessness, which leads to judgment and then a call to repentance and then goodness and flourishing and shalom and rest and peace until they fall into faithlessness again and the cycle repeats again and again. But as Judges goes on, the cycles get more and more broken. Even the Judges raised up get more and more complicated sin and faithlessness become more and more embedded in each cycle. And you see as you read through the book of Judges that it is less a series of cycles and more the spiraling downward until you get to the final verse of the book of Judges. Judges 21, verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. This is not a statement celebrating democracy or freedom and individual rights. This is a statement. This is a condemnation. This is a judgment on the people's refusal and inability to live in and live as the covenant community that the Lord had called and liberated them to be. This is a condemnation of faithlessness that has worked its way into everything. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. And then, if you're in Judges, you turn the page, and there's the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, in the days when everyone was only doing what was right in their own eyes, in the days of faithlessness and disobedience, in the days of warfare and conflict, in the days of national failure, in the days of the failure of the people to live out and live into God's covenant, in the days of faithlessness everywhere, there was a famine in the land. In the days of judgment, in the, the book of Judges, uh, in those sort of cycles, something like a famine was judgment and a picture of faithlessness. In these days of faithlessness and famine, verse 1 of Ruth begins and then goes on and says, In these days, a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. There is famine. Even Bethlehem, the name means house of bread. There is a famine even in Bethlehem. The house of bread is empty. Even in the house of bread, there is no bread. The pantry of faithfulness is bare. And we read in this book of Ruth, this little tiny book, 
an unfolding story, a small, intimate, and entirely negligible story in the scheme of everything else that is going on in the marchings and movements of the nations and the powers that be. And we find that it is this little story nestled in all of this. And it is a story of faithfulness. Small, intimate, and in the scheme of all the things, entirely insignificant, but faithfulness nonetheless. It's the story of Ruth, an outsider, a Moabite, and a widow. And she is acting, though, with covenant faithfulness to her Jewish widowed mother-in-law, Naomi. And through this, because of her seemingly small acts of faithfulness to Naomi, she finds herself now a stranger in a strange land. And it's through this that she meets Boaz. And Boaz acts in small ways, but in covenant faithfulness ways toward Ruth doing what is right and called for to provide for the outsider, the marginalized, and the widowed Ruth. This is the story of choices made by both Ruth and Boaz, choosing in seemingly small, insignificant ways, choosing faithfulness where they can, of doing what is required in that moment, in the best and most faithful ways they know how or, or that they can even muster given the circumstances in which they find themselves. And a word that shows up again and again to describe these small, seemingly insignificant and uh, what difference could it possibly make in the big scheme of thing choices. When we've just read the book of Judges and we know all that is going on in the world around them, it's this little Hebrew word chesed. It is a word that is so often used in Psalms and the prophets to describe the Lord's covenant, steadfast faithfulness and loving kindness to the people. Chesed is exactly what was not in Judges on the people's part. In the days when Chesed was impossible to find, there showed up in the lives and choices of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. There showed up through this particular Moabite widow, Ruth, a foreigner to the promised land and a stranger to the covenant. There showed up in her and her choices a covenant faithfulness. And through her, Chesed showed up to Naomi, this grieving daughter of Israel, and through that, through Boaz, back to Ruth. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. As it turned out, the very salvation and redemption of, of the ancient nation of Israel, the very covenant people of God, hinged. It turned on the faithfulness, the chesed of these few particular, seemingly insignificant people in the scheme of things, of their faithfulness toward other particular, seemingly insignificant people in their very particular and yet also in another way, their very, so very common and everyday people and circumstances of life. And if we do not have this, I do not know what would have happened if Ruth and Naomi and Boaz had not made the choices they did to act in faithfulness to one another, right? To act in just the best way they knew how and they could in the moments they were given. Who knows, right? Who knows how God would have yet worked? But what I do know, what we do know, is that that is what happened, that that is a part of how God was at work in and through human history. And so human history suddenly becomes intertwined with salvation history. The story of who Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz were is a part of who Jesus is. 
Mark confronted and challenged us to be on the lookout for literally all heaven breaking loose and earth-shattering work of God showing up in our midst. (coughs) Excuse me. And this is absolutely a part of watching and waiting for the coming of Christ. Right? And we are certainly right to pray for Jesus to show up in big ways and do big things. We certainly need it. But now Matthew also invites us to be on the lookout for everyday, normal, seemingly insignificant moments and opportunities for simply, maybe even seemingly insignificantly, acting in kindness and faithfulness wherever we find ourselves in whatever ways we can, and to see that there is a profound and deep grace at work with a God who has so chosen to enter into the so very human and everyday parts of human history, that that too becomes a part of salvation history that perhaps expectantly watching and waiting for the coming of Christ, asking Jesus to show up is also as simple as choosing loving kindness and faithfulness the best way we know how in the moments that we are given and trusting that God is in those unfolding moments as well. Jesus has come. For these indeed are the generations of Jesus the Messiah. So let's sing. Come, thou long expected Jesus. Hymn number two. Please stand in body or in spirit. Please remain standing uh, as we say together what we believe using the Apostles' Creed, which you can find printed in your bulletin. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And as you do so, I'm going to invite Lily Coney to come up uh, with our Minute for Mission uh, about the, uh, the upcoming Joy Offering Collection uh, that we'll be taking up on Christmas Eve. The minute for mission uh, today is titled, and there's really no way you can fail. Like the Magi from the east who followed the star to Bethlehem, only to return home another way, the route of mother-daughter duo of Carlo Luca and Susanna LeMay took some unexpected turns. Their respective roads surprisingly led them to study in the same place at the same time at Presbyterian-related Stelma College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Carla began her undergraduate education in 1998, but she left school after only a year when her daughter Susanna was born, followed by twin boys. Not long afterward, she took a break to raise her family. After years of working unsatisfying jobs, she knew she needed something more, an intellectual challenge and spiritual connection, and she found it at Stelman. Meanwhile, her daughter Susanna was living and studying in South Korea, where her military father was stationed at the time. But she also wanted to find something meaningful she was interested in music, so her mother suggested to come to Selma to study music journalism. Susanna transferred and joined in activities at the school. She learned that as you get into the community, there's really no way you can fail because people will absolutely give you the tools and the knowledge that you need. Providing students like Carla and Susanna with support they need to succeed is what the Presbyterian Church USA Christmas Joy Offering is all about. The offering distributes gifts equally to Presbyterian-related schools and colleges equipping communities of color and the assistant program of the Board of Pension. Carl and Susanna have unique stories. The fact that they have both flourished in their studies and they both confess that their relationship with one another has grown to new breadths and depths. It's in no small part due to the nourishing uh, community they found at Stelma College. Carla is grateful to the Presbyterian Church USA for the gifts they made her and her daughter's education possible. She goes on to say, when I think about how I how I have grown more spiritually and what I have learned at Stelma, especially what Dr. King said about the light of Christ being in everyone, to be able to see that light of Christ reflected in my own child is a really beautiful thing to experience as a mom. Your gifts to the Christmas Joy Orphan help bring the light that can help those like Carla and Susanna and so many others shine. Please, give whatever you can, for when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. God of wisdom and passion, we thank you for ways that you have shaped our hearts and souls and minds. Be with those who learn and those who teach. May our generous gifts to the Christmas Joy offering Support this vital mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lily. Psalm 85 says, Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. 
In response to what we have received in the coming of Christ and the goodness the Lord has given, let us each consider how we are called to respond in faithfulness that we may further the righteousness and peace of God's path in the world. If this includes giving to the ministry of this church, you may do so now as the offering plates are passed. Let us respond as those who have received the good news of great joy. God, most high, receive the gifts of our lives as an offering of gratitude for your grace. Overshadow us with your Holy Spirit and let it be with us according to your word, for nothing is impossible with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before we pray here in, in just a moment, uh, I do want to uh, draw your attention to uh, some of what's going on in the life of the church. You can find uh, all, uh, all the announcements, um, calendar of events in the, the bulletin, uh, in the announcements insert there. If you're, um, if you're online, uh, you can find it on our website as well. Uh, there's a, a bunch of uh, several fellowship opportunities coming up this week. Lunch with the pastor on Wednesday, senior moments with DA also on Wednesday, uh, ladies fellowship uh, cookie exchange, um, on sun next Sunday, right after uh, after worship, um, we also have uh, coming up in uh, a week and a half or so on the 21st is our longest night service. Um, this is our uh, an, an annual service we do uh, on the longest night of the year. It's not the longest service. Um, it's the longest, just on the longest night. Um, that is, uh, you know, we uh, we. Uh, sing with joy and we hear messages of joy and peace and um, and these are good things and we celebrate this time of year um, but many of us also know that um, the, this time of year can also be difficult um, it can be hard uh, for a variety of reasons and that's what the longest night service is about so it is an opportunity and creates space um, for even amidst our celebration of Christmas it creates space to say and still it's okay to not feel okay. It's okay for things not to be okay, um, because God is in that as well. Um, Sometimes God is especially there in that. Uh, And so that's what the longest night service is about. So I hope you will mark your calendars. Um, Think of, you know, if there's uh, friends, family, neighbors that might uh, benefit from a service and a space and a time like that, uh, please let them know. There's some flyers out uh, in the narthex. You can grab some and um, let people know. Um, but uh, yeah, please be sure to, to check out all, uh, all of what's going on uh, in the life of the church. But now it is time for us to pray. Uh, so as we do that, are there any prayer requests, any joys or concerns? Uh, we want to uh, continue to keep, um, keep Dave Pack and his family 
uh, in our prayers. Dave's father, Chong Rock, has um, begun hospice care, um, so we want to continue to to keep them in our prayers. Um, and I know uh, Abby uh, and Colin Dust, uh, formerly Abby Gorvet. Um, uh, Colin is in the National Guard, and he was moved to a more dangerous area. Um, so uh, we want to keep uh, Abby and Colin in our prayers. Are there any any others? Okay, let's. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Watching and waiting for the coming of Christ, we pray for the promise of a new creation, saying, Come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. And so with expectation, we pray for the church. May we hear the word your messengers speak so that we can change, our hearts can be changed, and our actions and lives lived in holy and faithfulness. So come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for the world. Speak peace to your people and through your people so that we might become agents of your peace. Do not let us return to foolish ways, but come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for this and all of our communities. May your steadfast love and truth meet in the, this place and righteousness and peace embrace in our streets so that all our communities will flourish. So come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for loved ones. As you know the needs and hopes of each person, bring comfort to all who are mourning or anxious who are in pain or lonely. And let us hear the compassionate words that you speak. Lord, we continue to lift up Dave Pack and his father, Chong Rock, and all of their family. And we pray for Abby and Colin. Watch over and protect Colin and be with Abby. and Bring peace to worried and anxious hearts. And indeed, all those who are in need of healing or are recovering from healing, we pray. For them, we pray. And for those who grieve the loss of loved ones, those who are preparing to leave behind what is familiar for a new chapter. As we have looked at the Jesus lineage this morning, Lord, we pray for and lift up all of us who are inheritors of complicated lineages. And hear us now, Lord, as we lift silently up to you the prayers that rest and wrestle with our hearts and our minds. Come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. God, our hope as the promised day approaches, fill us with the joy of your Holy Spirit and strengthen us to serve you faithfully through Christ, who is coming to reign. And in the meantime, may our lives and our life together boldly reflect the prayer that he taught us, even as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please stand in body or in spirit as we sing our closing hymn, Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, hymn number eight.
Now, beloved, may the God of peace make you holy and the power sustain you until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Prepare the way of the Lord. Amen.